Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening uh, for this uh, sublime music of Johann Sebastian Bach. You're in for a real treat. I have been a, a lucky person to be able to listen to the Appleton Ensemble as they have been uh, preparing for this concert over the last couple of days. Uh, my name is Charles Nazarian, and I'm the president of the Gloucester Meeting House Foundation. Our responsibility is the preservation of this building, uh, which is uh, the oldest surviving church building in Gloucester and was completed in the fall of 1806 for the first Universalist church in America. Uh, the church was founded by the Reverend John Murray, whose portrait is to my right, and his partner was Judith Sargent Murray, who I should have lit, and I'll put her on afterwards. Um, John Murray was known for his liberal religious views and was the uh, chaplain to the Rhode Island Regiment under George Washington. He was a good friend of John Adams, and uh, through a famous court case, uh, he helped to establish uh, the freedom of religion in Massachusetts and also to influence the separation of church and state as enshrined in the First Amendment through his connection to um, Adams and Washington and to Franklin. His wife is known as America's first female playwright. Uh, she felt also that women should be given equal opportunities for education as men since her brothers were sent to Harvard, but she was homed, homeschooled. And uh, she was writing to Franklin and insisting that women have the vote in the original Constitution. So this building is the embodiment of the belief in equal rights, of social justice, and of religious freedom in America. And uh, it was built uh, both as a church and as you'll be able to hear this evening with acoustics like a concert hall long before there was amplification. And it was built with 600 seats. And when uh, John Murray's uh, uh, ministry got going and people recognized this wonderful message of inclusion, this place, if you can imagine it, was full every Sunday with 600 people. So our, uh, our job at the Meeting House Foundation is to preserve the building, and so far we've made it handicap accessible. Uh, we have added a sprinkler system and a fire detection system, and even filled the walls with fireproof insulation. Uh, this, we hope, will mean that now that the building is in its third century, that it will survive. Uh, the concert series uh, of which we are closing uh, this evening has had a wonderful run from last fall until now. And we are greatly indebted to the sponsors of this series who have made this possible. Um, many of you are, uh, know each other, or, but if you would look on the front of the program, I hope you will recognize friends who are sponsors of this series. And it's very varied. It uh, involves a lot of civic engagement, such as a symposium in the fall on an important uh, to topic every year. We do a Martin Luther King Day celebration in January. Uh, we do a kids movie and pizza day in February, as well as fine music concerts. And so um, this building is really alive and it's such a pleasure to be able to offer it to the people of Cape Ann. We are also very much indebted to our two co-sponsors for tonight's concert. Uh, unfortunately, both of them are in Europe. Um, Woody Brock, who I think is somewhere in the British Isles, but I'm not quite sure where, and uh, Scobie Ward, and I'm not sure where Scobie is either, but somewhere on the other side of the pond, but maybe in Greece. But we do have Scobie's mom here, and so I think a round of applause is in order. <laughs> By the way, she plays the viola, so um, music comes very naturally. Um, we also have a few other thanks. Uh, the Atlantic Vacation Homes, um, uh, Carol and Bill, who are seated here, helped us out with housing 
for a number of the musicians in a beautiful home overlooking the Anasquam River. And uh, Jackie and JJ Bell, who are here, um, offered their cottage and to the conductor and uh, to the harpsichordist, uh, both of whom have decided that they're not leaving because <laughs> it is so beautiful. Uh, so uh, thanks to uh, Carol and Bill and also uh, to JJ and Jackie. Um, there are other thanks uh, as well in terms of the people who uh, make this series possible. Sandra Ronan in particular, who is the head of our events committee, uh, who helps put together these programs, and especially our outdoor summer series, which will begin on Friday evening after the 4th of July and run all the way until the first week in September. Those concerts are outside on the green, and each one of them is a benefit for a different nonprofit. So come and picnic with us, enjoy the music outside, and uh, put some money in the bucket for a good cause every week. Now the Appleton Consort um, gets its name uh, from Appleton, Wisconsin, and uh, the conductor, uh, Mark Dupere, is gonna tell you a little bit more about that during the program. Uh, many of you are aware that they are playing on what are called original or period instruments. Uh, the harpsichord, of course, but also the stringed instruments. And these instruments are different than our modern instruments in many ways. Uh, the strings on some of them are actually made from, from gut, which is then stretched and made uh, in order to become the strings for the, for the uh, string bass. Um, the uh, oboes work very differently and have, are made out of wood uh, and have an incredibly pungent sound to them. And you, if you have keen hearing, you will also realize that the tuning is not the same as you might expect in modern music. And there are two things going on there. One is that the pitch at A is at 415 hertz. Whereas today, our modern pitch is higher, more treble oriented at 440. And so everything is tuned a little bit lower than what we're used to in modern music. And the temperament of the instruments, the system, the way it is tuned, is not the same as a modern instrument in which every key it sounds the same, and that's called equal temperament. The instruments are tuned in an unequal temperament that gives flavor to each one of the keys, one from the next. And you will hear how Bach uses that in the music, and Mark and a few others will explain a bit more about that. So I think you're here for the music, and I'd like to introduce to you the Appleton Consort. Um, if you would all come on out. Please give them a full round of applause.
evening. Thank you so much for being here. We're delighted to uh, put this program together for you. It's just such wonderful music, and it's been such a joy for us. Uh, you know, a lot of this music we kind of grew up with, or at least I did. I listened to a lot of this music growing up. And it's amazing to me, even in the last few days, uh, how alive it still is, and how fresh it is, and how much youthfulness is. It's just extraordinary music. So um, you see the program, it says An Evening at the Coffee House. Well, that's kind of an unusual title. I'm like, well, that doesn't really make really a lot of sense. Back in the late 17th century, coffee was the new rage in Europe. It actually was there about 100 years before in Southern Europe. But in Germany, in Leipzig, the city where Bach arrived at this family in 1723, there were a number of coffee houses there. Um, one today, Coffee Baum is still in existence today. It's a lovely place. And another really uh, famous one that was there from that same time was the Café Zimmermann. And um, apart from Bach's responsibility of organizing music at four churches in Leipzig and directing at two churches, he was also, also the director of the Collegium Musicum, which gave weekly concerts at this coffee house Wednesday nights, and they were free to the public. Um, of course, you were expected to probably buy some coffee at the time. Um, but uh, apparently they were like two hours long. We, we're not gonna do that for you tonight. But the idea of tonight's performance was to give um, examples of instrumental and orchestral music of Bach in all the spheres. So we just heard an orchestral suite. There's, that's one of four that we know in existence. We have a Brandenburg concerto tonight. We have a violin concerto. There was probably 17 concertos. Um, so we have kind of music from all the different spheres. But the other unusual, maybe not so well-known sphere of, of Bach's orchestral music is his symphonias. And you wouldn't really know them unless you knew the cantatas. There's about 20 or 30 or so symphonias that are just hidden uh, gems in, in the cantata repertoire. And we have two examples tonight. Uh, later in the performance, we have one from a sacred cantata, but we have one now that's a secular cantata. Um, and what's unusual about it, it's one of two Italian pieces that Bach wrote, and obviously everything he mostly wrote in was German. He wrote some Latin music as well, but this is one of two Latin, uh, excuse me, uh, Italian pieces, and it was probably written for this coffee house. Um, this cantata is for soprano solo, as strings, continuo, and solo flute. And so um, I just wanted to give a little background about this particular symphonia. Um, it's a farewell. Symphonia that uh, was, we're not quite sure who it's meant for, but one of the friends in this, in this uh, group, or it could be a university student, or some, one of their colleagues that was leaving Leipzig to go move to another city. And what I just realized this last week, there's all this imagery of the sea, and as if, that's, if this person is about to embark on a voyage. And so I just wanted to read a little bit of the text from the last aria, and it's so fitting that we're just up the road from the port here. But if you can imagine, this music is to say farewell to a friend. To port now with fear and with sorrow, as with the helmsman winds placated, fears no more nor pales with terror, but upon his prow contented, doth with singing face the sea. And it's almost like this launch, if you will. So it's kind of an interesting little thing. Anyway, uh, again, delighted you're here tonight, and now the next symphonian. Thank you very much.
just like Mark uh, said earlier, um, that he had grown up listening to a lot of this music. Um, the first movement of this concerto um, is included in one of the Suzuki books. So at the beginning of rehearsals, I was asked if I had ever played it as a child. And I didn't grow up as a Suzuki kid, so in fact, I didn't. And I learned this piece for the first time for this concert, so it's been really nice to come to it uh, with a really fresh perspective. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really great piece. I mean, it's, it does sort of try and spotlight a little bit on the violin, but in fact, it's a great piece for the band, and this is a great band to play with, so um, we've had a really good time with it, um, and I hope you do, too. Thank you.
Maine and crops there, and he got into linen and cloths and that sort of thing, and importing and exporting with his brother down in Boston, back and forth with Europe, uh, was a, quite a wealthy man, and upon retirement was very charitable and gave money to Dartmouth and Amherst and Harvard. If you know the Memorial Chapel at Harvard, it's called actually the Appleton Chapel. And he also donated $10,000 to uh, Lawrence University in Appleton, and the, and the town's actually named after him. So there's a little bit of connection there. I just wanted to share that with you. It's kind of interesting. And there's all sorts of other things in Boston with his, na his name. I'm sure you can follow that. Anyway, um, again, thank you so much for being here tonight, and hope you enjoy the second half. Thank you. Thank you. 
something about it. Um, in 1721, Bach sends a beautifully written presentation copy of six concertos for the Marquis of Brandenburg. And he says in the title, six concertos for various instruments, which is a massive understatement. Everyone is completely different. And he uses the instruments in really weird and innovative ways. Um, the orchestra, the 18th century orchestra, is a very... Um, just very orderly thing where everything is structured and everyone's in their place. And 18th century society was very much like this and Bach railed against this in many different ways. He got into lots of conflict with his employers. And um, people have suggested these concertos represent, you know, some of these interests in doing things differently. The one we're gonna hear has three soloists, me, violin, and flute. And the music um, alternates between the three of us, um, sort of in an upper register, the cello glues everything together, and then all the other people sort of come in for these other sections. Another really innovative thing about this piece is, is the writing for the harpsichord. In every other piece that I've played today, I've been improvising. I don't get a part written out, I get the score, some numbers that show me what the chords are. And just like in jazz, I, my job is to sort of fill things in, keep things moving. Um, and in this piece, the harpsichord part is fully written out by the composer, which is a relatively new idea. Um, interestingly, um, Vivaldi and Handel, born in the same year as Bach, all independently created keyboard concertos exactly the same time. These guys didn't know each other. Um, and the harpsichord part just starts to sort of metastasize and just go crazy. And, you know, eventually I win and, you know, it's the best part of the whole concert. These guys all start playing and it's just me. And um, I think there's really a direct line from, from this uh, extraordinary piece with this amazing solo harpsichord writing to all the piano concertos that, that we all know and love. This really is, is a really original idea and um, ended up being a very popular kind of genre.
Thank you.